what I want to do is uh, spend a, a little bit of time talking about work, and I want to uh, leave a lot of time for question and answer, so this won't take long, I hope. <clears throat> I, uh, I handed off my timepiece to somebody else, so uh, give me a signal when I'm getting up to around 30 minutes. I'll, I'll try to bring it to a close. Uh, what I want to focus on particularly is the way that the Lord's Supper uh, affects our understanding of work, the aims of work, uh, the character of work, the point of work in God's world. Uh, I tend to use the word Eucharist a lot. That's in my title, Eucharist between creation and eschaton. And I know that there are some church traditions that avoid using that terminology to describe the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion or what the Lord's Table, whatever other uh, term or phrase you might use to describe it. It's become habitual. I'm not going to be able to stop myself from using the word Eucharist. I, don't, I hope it's not offensive or an obstacle to trying to uh, uh, receive what I'm saying. Uh, in defense of the term Eucharist, uh, the word Eucharist, as I'm sure most of you know, is from the Greek, uh, which uh, from the verb to mean give thanks. Uh, and the Eucharist, uh, the Lord's Supper, is called the Eucharist because it's a meal that includes an act of thanksgiving. When Jesus said, do this, he did tell his disciples to eat bread and to drink wine, but he said to do this, and he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke the bread and distributed it. So Eucharist is inherent in the meal that we celebrate. Uh, Eucharist is a, a good term to describe the tone, or at least one dimension of the tone of Christian living. And I'm going to argue of Christian labor. Uh, to work Christianly is to work Eucharistically. It's to work with thanksgiving and to take the world in hand uh, receiving it with thanks, and then working in the world to glorify it and to bring glory to our Creator. So um, that's a, a bit of an explanation of why I use that terminology. And again, I hope it's not an obstacle to following what I what I plan to say. I'm going to say a few words about the cre uh, about the creation account and how creation sheds light on our understanding of work. I suspect that this will be very familiar territory to you, so I won't spend a lot of time with it. Uh, I want to, again, focus particularly on the Eucharistic dimensions of work and what, that, what the practice of the Eucharist tells us and teaches us about the nature of our work, and also uh, recognizing that the Eucharist is an act, a liturgical action, how that liturgical action orients us rightly to the labor that we do when we're not gathered for worship. Those are the two things I want to focus on. A few things about creation to start. Of course, work is not part of the curse. Labor is part of the original commission of Adam. Before he falls, he's told that he's supposed to subdue the earth, to fill it, to rule it. He's supposed to work in the earth in order to glorify it and to change it. That's not something that comes with the curse. It's not something that is, uh, that's a, 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 a demeaning activity for Adam. In, in fact, uh, to work is to express and to work out the image of God. Uh, the first vision that we have of God in the Bible is a, as a speaker, as somebody who does things, but also as somebody who makes things. He makes things by speaking, but he also makes things, particularly he makes Adam, by being something like a potter, the verb that's used in Genesis to describe what the Lord does with the ground to form the Adama into the Adam. What he does with the ground is the same verb that you would use to describe what a potter does. Uh, our God is not like the gods of the ancient Greeks, who are gods of leisure, uh, gods who sit in, uh, in uh, bliss, enjoying ambrosia and what other, what other else might be, uh, whatever else might be available in the uh, uh, cafeteria, the uh, Olympic cafeteria. Um, rather, our God is, from the beginning of the Bible, a worker. And so when we work, uh, we're imaging God when we engage in labor. We're doing what God does. Uh, throughout the Bible, God is described as uh, carrying out the various activities that are common vocations of human beings in the Bible, in the biblical world. He's a potter. He's an architect, Proverbs 8. When he creates, he works like an architect with wisdom at his side. He's a good shepherd. Uh, he's, he's a husbandman of animals. He's a vintner. He takes care, he plants and takes care of a vine and then produces the wine from that vine. <clears throat> So uh, being a worker is not some, uh, uh, it's not part of the fall, it's not some kind of decline from an original uh, life of leisure and contemplation. It's what we're called to do and to be. And human beings are created to 
uh, work in the world in order to change it and in order to glorify it. The world was made with glory. The world as made already manifests the glory of God and speaks of God's glory. But then God places human beings in the world to change things and to turn a glorious world into a world that's more glorious. This is the story of human history. God makes a glorious world. He places Adam in a garden and he expects Adam to exploit, not in a, not in a, a, a oppressive or dominating sense, but to uh, bring out the potentialities of the creation in order to turn that original raw materials, of, the original raw materials of the world into a glorious city. At the end of the Bible, we don't have a, a garden. We don't have a return to the beginning. We instead have a glorified garden, a garden city, the new Jerusalem. Uh, human beings are, exist in the world in order to participate in God's creative glorification of his already glorious world. And I think we already see this, uh, a hint of this in Genesis 1 in the creation account. Uh, the first couple of days, God is just speaking and doing things. Let there be light and there is light. Let there be a firmament between the waters above and the waters below. And there's a firmament that separates, separates the waters from the waters. Uh, let the waters part and the, the dry land appear. He's just making things happen by saying them. But then in the middle of day three, God speaks to the earth. Let the earth produce grasses with seeds in them and uh, trees with fruit in it, uh, grains and fruit, uh, fruit plants. Let the earth produce that. The earth can't do that on its own. The earth doesn't have the inherent potential to produce anything on its own. But when the word of God speaks to the earth, the earth brings something new into existence. And from that point on, we have a number of indications that the creation itself is participating by the power of God's word in its own formation. Okay. It's not just that God spoke the word into existence and you immediately get the fully formed world that we have, nor is it simply that God speaks every individual thing into existence without the participation of the creation. The creation actually participates in its own completion. We have a hint of this too. This would take a more time to uh, develop, but it, we have a hint of this too, I think, in uh, Exodus. In Exodus 25 to 31, it's the, uh, the account of the, um, uh, the, the tabernacle, the description of the tabernacle. It's the pattern of the tabernacle that Moses is supposed to uh, use to guide the, the uh, creation of the formation of that tent where God is going to dwell. That passage in Exodus 25 to 31, where the tabernacle is first described, is divided up into seven sections. And each section begins with, Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, and then Yah seven times. And the seventh time he says, Yahweh, it says, Yahweh spoke to Moses. He says, keep the Sabbath. You have a sequence of seven speeches from God, and the seventh one is a command to keep Sabbath. And a number of scholars have pointed out that there are parallels between the speeches that God gives to Moses and the speeches of the original creation week. God is speaking a new world, a microcosm of the, of the tabernacle into existence by giving speeches to Moses. But of course, this isn't a fiat. This isn't a tabernacle ex nihilo. He speaks to Moses and then Moses acts on the basis of that word to form the microcosm that is the tabernacle. And by forming a microcosm, the tabernacle, in the world, this is the first time that God has dwelt among his people in a tent. This is a new thing in the world. And it comes into being not by the unmediated, unmediated word of God, but by the word of God mediated through human action, through human skill, and through human labor. So uh, human beings are put in the world to do what God does, to be creative laborers in the world, to take this glorious creation that God gave us and to make it more glorious. Of course, because of sin, human beings continue to reorient and remake the world, but they do it in uh, sinful ways and uh, destroy it rather than uh, forming it to be more and more glorious. Now, what I want to suggest is that the Eucharist gives us some, in, some idea of what it means to be a laborer between the original creation where Adam is uh, put, put in the world to glorify it and the final eschaton when uh, we have a, a city uh, that is adorned with all the treasures that come from the kings and the nations of the earth. The Eucharist gives us an indication of how our work is to be oriented. In order to see that, we have to break away 
at least partly from some of the most of the historic debates concerning the Eucharist, concerning the Lord's Supper. Uh, not that those questions that are raised about the real presence particularly uh, and the physics and metaphysics of the real presence, those, aren't, those, are, those are important questions. I'm not trying to sidestep or diminish those. I think there are good answers to those questions and there are bad answers to those questions. But if that's all we think about when we think about the Lord's Supper, then we're only grasping one part of a larger whole. Uh, I like to think about this as uh, the difference between a, a zoom lens sacramental theology and a wide angle lens sacramental theology. The zoom lens Eucharistic theology focuses just on the bread and the wine and asks the question, what, is, what are these things? What are these things before a prayer of consecration? What are they after the prayer of consecration? Okay. But there's lots of other things going on. You don't have a Lord's Supper unless there are people. You don't have a proper Lord's Supper unless there are people who are receiving the bread and the wine and eating and drinking it. Paul says you don't have a proper Lord's Supper if you eat and drink badly. If you come to the Lord's table and you're being selfish and there are factions at the Lord's table and the, the better off are getting more and the lesser off, the, the poor members of the congregation are getting less. Paul says, it's not the Lord's Supper that you're doing. This is so perverted that it's like it, you're not even gathering for the Lord's Supper anymore. Um, so that's, that's all part of, has to be part of our theologizing about the Lord's Supper. It's not just the uh, zoom lens question of what's on the table after the prayer of thanksgiving or consecration. It's the larger issue of what the community is doing and how this affects the community. And particularly, I think we have to break away from the uh, historic tendency, perhaps especially in Western theology, this is, of course, what Eastern theologians will say, Orthodox theologians will tell you, this is a, a Western malady. But perhaps that's right, perhaps it's an especially Western problem to think of the Eucharist in isolation, not just the, the elements in isolation from the rest of the Lord's Supper, but the event of the Lord's Supper in isolation from the rest of the world. As if this were some sacred moment in an otherwise secular life. That's not what worship is. Worship is not an isolated island of sacredness or, really, or religious activity within a world that's secular, within a life that's uh, not religious. Rather, in worship, uh, we're being oriented and formed, we're, we're presenting ourselves and our works to God in praise, in thanksgiving, but we're also being oriented and formed in worship so that we can be proper actors in the world. There, uh, we need to get away from this dichotomy of worship and the rest of life, the liturgy and the rest of life. So we have to uh, kind of break down our understanding of the, what the, uh, at least just some historic understandings of what the Lord's Supper is about in order to see what it tells us about work. But I think this is actually what the New Testament shows us about the Lord's Supper. Paul's most extensive discussion of the Lord's Supper comes in 1 Corinthians, uh, particularly in chapters 10 and 11. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul is mainly dealing with not metaphysical questions about the bread and the wine. He's dealing with questions about community life. Uh, that's what the whole discussion is about. Uh, he's talking about people who are being selfish. He talks about factions at the supper. As I said, it's gotten so bad that it's, not, it's like it's not the Lord's Supper at all. And uh, Paul uses the Lord's Supper as well as baptism as a kind of criterion to judge how well the community is living together. What happens at the Lord's Supper is an expression of the way that that community ought to live, but they don't do that. They aren't living Eucharistically. They aren't living according to the pattern of their common meals. And because of that, Paul thinks that they are in danger of coming under judgment. It's not just that it's a criterion, but the supper is actually part of, the, uh, part of God's work to form the community into the kind of community it ought to be. You are, we are one loaf, Paul says, because, we are one body because we partake of one loaf. One body because of one loaf. It's not simply that we're expressing what we already have when we come and share the common loaf. We're actually being formed by participation in that common loaf to be the united body that we're called to be. So in that, in that passage, Paul uses the Eucharist both as a criteria for judging how the community is living together, 
and also sees the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, as part of the way that God forms the community into the kind of community it ought to be. And I want to suggest that the, you can do the same thing, have the same kind of usage, use and reflections about the Lord's Supper with regard to work. What does, the, what does the Lord's Supper tell us about the nature of work and the end, particularly the ends of work? The first thing we can notice is that when we come to the Lord's Supper, we are receiving and sharing cultural products. We don't come and get a handful of grain. I, I, don't, I doubt that any of you, you get lots of different kinds of bread and uh, semi-breads that are uh, served at the Lord's Supper. I don't know that anybody has ever celebrated the Lord's Supper with raw grain. And to turn raw grain into bread takes a lot of work. You've got to, first of all, grow the grain. You've got to transform it into flour. You've got to mix it and bake it. And it's only at the end of that process that it comes to the Lord's table where you're, uh, where you're actually sharing it. Or uh, you might have a wafer in the, in the supper and then you have Maybe there's grain in the wafer. I don't know. Does actually grain goes into those wafers? I don't know what goes into those wafers. You take out everything that resembles bread and you get a wafer, but it still is a cultural product. Okay. I think it's, as, as, uh, as is clear from that comment, I think it should look like bread and be bread, not a plastic styrofoam wafer. Yes, of, of course, winemaking. Uh, I, I don't know what the custom is in your churches. Maybe wine is not what you use, but if you're... Um, if you're using wine, then that takes a great deal of care and skill in order to bring that uh, product to the Lord's table. Well, even if it's grape juice, it's still the product of human labor. Uh, we bring cultural products and we consume cultural products in the Lord's Supper. So at the very least, we can say that the Eucharist is a resounding liturgical endorsement of the kinds of changes and transformations that human beings affect in the world. Uh, the Eucharist shows us that the, uh, the Bible doesn't endorse undeveloped nature as the ideal, okay? Uh, it doesn't, it, it uh, endorses and affirms the good that human beings affect, uh, the, the good of the transformations and changes that human beings affect on the world. Untarnished nature is not our standard. Uh, the Eucharist is at least a sign that we can come into the Lord's presence and we can enjoy a meal in his presence with things that have been transformed by human labor, not just things that are, um, that are directly from his hand. I think the Eucharist also gives us an indication of the goal or end of human labor. And I want to sum this up by saying that the goal or end of human labor, at least at a superficial level, at a first level, is shared festivity. The goal of human labor is shared festivity. We work in the world in order to profit from it, to gain some personal profit. If you're a bread maker and you, have the, you do the whole process of bread making from the grain, growing the grain all the way to bringing the loaf out of the oven, uh, you're doing that so that you can eat grain. Okay. Uh, but that's not all that you do. Very few of us eat loaves of bread by ourselves. If you're a baker and you're selling bread, you're baking the bread in order to sell it and share it with others. If you're making it in your home, you're getting it for your own profit. You want to consume part of it, but you want your whole family to consume it. Uh, I think, in fact, very few people actually operate on a pure profit motive. That's almost inconceivable that somebody would operate in the world on a pure profit motive. The only, the only goal of my work is that I benefit from it, you know. People are very greedy, but very few people actually do that. <laughs> what people mostly do is do it for the sake of their own profit, but also to share at least with a few of their close family and friends. The reason why men go to work and earn, you know, the, the old 1960s phrase, they earn bread uh, so they can share that bread with their families. Okay. It's shared festivity. That's the goal of work. It's shared, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a shared consumption of what we make and what we produce in the world. And it's a festive consumption. Uh, it's not just that we take the grain out of the ground, even that is a product of human labor. It's not just that we take the grain out of the ground and we share out the grain, we transform it, we make it something else, we make it more glorious, we make it better so that we can share it together, share 
the enjoyable creation made more enjoyable by our work. Work isn't just for, uh, we don't work just for utilitarian purposes. That's part of what the Eucharist is showing us. We don't just work for utilitarian purposes. We don't just grow food in order to survive as to have bodily fuel. If we did that, then we would be content with raw grapes and with grains and just what we could find out in the, we could be hunters and gatherers or we could go, go to some kind of subsistence living and we would just eat the raw, raw products that come out of the ground. We don't do that. We do all kinds of things with food, especially in our time. We do all kinds of things with food. Uh, food becomes an art. Uh, some of that is decadent, uh, not all of it. It's inherent in human beings. Uh, there are uh, many, uh, many, sh many things that we share with the animals, but uh, Samuel Johnson said, there is no beast who is a cook. That's one of the distinctive marks of human existence, that we prepare our food, and not just prepare it so that it's, more, it's easier for us to consume, we prepare our food so that it's more enjoyable for us to consume. The Eucharist shows us that the goal of human labor is not just personal profit, but sharing in the goods of the earth. It's not simply to meet utilitarian needs, meet our needs of survival, but to uh, enjoy the world and make it, uh, enjoy the products of our works, work which has made it more enjoyable. That's, I said, it's at, at one level, shared festivity is the goal of labor. But this shared festivity in the Eucharist is shared festivity that takes place in the presence of God. There's a transcendent dimension to our work. Uh, it's not simply that we do it so that we can share our bread with our family or our friends, not simply so that we can enjoy the creation, but we do this in the presence of God. You could say, uh, taking the, our, our uh, hints from the creation week, that human labor, like God's labor, is oriented towards Sabbath, toward rest and pleasure in the presence of God. Uh, we, uh, uh, in worship, we offer ourselves to God, I think part of the meaning of the Eucharist, this is something we might want to discuss further, but I think part of the meaning of the Eucharist uh, is an offering, certainly an offering of praise. The reformers all rejected the idea that Christ is somehow being re-sacrificed in the Lord's Supper, but they recognized that there was a sacrificial dimension to the Lord's Supper, uh, a sacrifice of praise. We praise God, we offer ourselves to God. I think we offer ourselves in the presence of bread and wine, we're offering ourselves and our works to God. And he's pleased with those. He's pleased with our, us as we present them to us, to uh, ourselves to him in Christ. He's pleased with our works as he receives them in Christ. But he's pleased in our works by giving our works back to us to enjoy. Okay. Uh, we uh, come into God's presence with the works of our hands, bread and the wine, bread and wine. We don't burn it the way they used to in the Old Testament. They would bring their, they bring their bread into the tabernacle and um, some of it would be burned, the rest of it would go to the priest. They wouldn't see it again. Okay. Occasionally they would be able to uh, enjoy some bread and uh, feast in the presence of God, but uh, most of it was consumed by somebody else or consumed on the altar. We come into the presence of God and bread and wine is there. And God takes pleasure in our works by letting us take pleasure in our own works. The things that we offer to God, we receive back so that we can enjoy them in his presence and so that those become means of communion with him. Okay. The bread that we break, is it not communion in the body of Christ? The cup that we bless, is it not communion in the, body, in the blood of Christ? When we, these are works of our hands that we are offering with ourselves to God, but he gives them back to us and they are now means of communion and fellowship with him. We bring our works into the presence of God. The Eucharist is showing us uh, t with thanksgiving. As I said at the beginning, thanksgiving is, has become one of the ways to describe the whole event, Eucharist. The whole event is Eucharistic uh, because when we offer the bread and the wine or we break and distribute the bread and the wine, the bread and the wine, uh, 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 we give thanks over them. Um, the bread is, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and distributed it took the cup, gave thanks, broke it, and distributed it. And this is, if we reflect on this, this is a, kind of an odd phenomenon. Uh, bread is, uh, doesn't drop from heaven. We're not in the wilderness anymore. Uh, manna doesn't show up every morning. Somebody had to, somebody we, most of it, for most of us, somebody we don't know and never will know, 
uh, made that bread for us, did all the work that was required to make bread. And then when we get it, we thank God for it. The works of our hands are also God's gifts to us, and they're part of this exchange that we have in fellowship with God. That Eucharistic moment in worship, that moment of thanksgiving in worship, is not, of course, the only time we give thanks. Paul tells us that we're supposed to give thanks for all things in all circumstances. Paul tells us that we give thanks for everything created. Everything created is good and nothing is to be rejected uh, if, it's received, if it's received with prayer and thanksgiving, if it's received with the word of God and prayer. Thanksgiving is a way of consecrating everything we have and do to God and to his glory. So having come into the presence of God and shared this Eucharistic meal, we're rightly oriented to engage in our work outside of worship, Eucharistically. We're rightly oriented so that whatever we take up uh, during the week to come becomes an act of thanksgiving. Even the things that we've made, we recognize as something that God has given to us. And so we live lives of continuous Eucharist, not just momentary or a Sunday Eucharist, but continuous Eucharist. So to summarize, what does the Eucharist teach us about work? It teaches us that God wants the creation to be cultivated. It teaches us that the goal of our presence in creation is to transform it and make it more glorious, something we can share and share in, with enjoyment in the presence of God. God has put us here to cultivate the creation, to cook it, to share it, uh, to uh, receive it in worship, to share it in worship so that it becomes a means of communion with him. God places us in the world so that we can live Eucharistically, which means so that we can engage in all our activities, all of our works uh, with thanksgiving, recognizing that both the gifts that come from him and even our own works are from him. Thanks very much.